All right. Uh, yeah, I think we, we're live. Uh, so good afternoon to everyone uh, in Europe or in this region. Uh, good morning to everyone in, in North America and good evening to everyone who's joining us from, from the East Asia region. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar on the Hong Kong security law and its uh, impact on press freedom. So we're here on July 29th, which is uh, almost one, one month to the day. Uh, since the law took effect. Uh, so, so this webinar, which is hosted by the International Press Institute, uh, we want to look into today uh, what has happened over the past month uh, of this very, what was always a very vague and, and uh, uh, vague law, uh, and to see uh, what has taken place over the past month, what the real, uh, real implications and interpretations of the law have been since then. Um, and we've got really a fantastic panel of experts with us today from a number of different uh, areas uh, of work in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm really, uh, really happy about this. I think it's gonna be a great discussion, but on a topic that's uh, obviously very serious and concerning uh, in Hong Kong, uh, basically to see, uh, yeah, democracy, the rule of law and press freedom disappear um, before our eyes uh, in, 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 in Hong Kong. Um, so, and that's also obviously what we want to, to discuss here today. So as I said, uh, I'm Scott Griffin, National Press Institute, which is a global press freedom organization. We've been defending press freedom independent journalism since we were founded in 1950. Uh, IPI is a, is a network, a global network of editors, publishers, and, and leading journalists. Uh, and we were among the, the, the numerous international civil society organizations that were warning about this law uh, before it was passed and had been covering um, the situation in Hong Kong back to the, the protests and violence against journalists that occurred uh, in recent years. Um, and I'm just going to very briefly introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, we have with us, uh, first of all, Tom Grundy, who is the editor in chief and founder of the Hong Kong Free Press. Uh, which is a nonprofit English language newspaper uh, based in Hong Kong, run by journalists and backed by its readers. Uh, we have uh, then with us Sharon Fast, who is the deputy director of the Master of Journalism program uh, and lecturer at the uh, Journalism and Media Studies Center at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, and then we've got with us An Anthony Dapper, who is a uh, Hong Kong writer and lawyer. He's the author of the recent book, uh, City on Fire, The Fight for Hong Kong, and is a regular commenter on Hong Kong issues in, in a variety of media. Uh, and finally, uh, we have uh, Chris Young, who is the chairperson of the Hong Kong Journalists Association. Uh, and the Hong Kong Journalists Association was established in 1960, leading, um, leading association for, for journalists in, Kong, in Hong Kong and a member of the International Federation of Journalists. So, Welcome to you all, and thanks again for joining us at this late hour in Hong Kong. But as I said, it's a really important topic, and, and we really want to keep this topic uh, in the international spot. Um, you know, we've, just to put it all in context, I mean, we have obviously what's going on in Hong Kong. We've seen some international reverberations about this. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the UK, US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada uh, ending their extradition or setting aside their extradition agreements with Hong Kong. Uh, we saw yesterday that the European Union announced some initial sanction type measures uh, that they'll be stopping the export of equipment that could be used for surveillance uh, type measures in, in Hong Kong. So we've seen some reaction from the international community, uh, but I think in our view, actually not enough. There hasn't been enough uh, global focus on, on what is going on in Hong Kong. So that's part of our effort to make sure that this issue really remains, uh, really remains in the limelight. So, uh, let's go ahead and get started with, with our guests and just, just to let everybody know, we'll start with the sort of discussion among the speakers here and then uh, we'll eventually move to, to questions uh, from the participants. So feel free at any time to go ahead and, and put your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll see them and then when it comes time for questions, we'll, we'll put them to the list here. So I actually want to start uh, today with, with Sharon. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there was a lot of uncertainty around this law. Uh, we didn't know what was in it. There was a lot of secrecy around it. Around it. Uh, you know, details were published, not published until the very last minute before it took effect. So now it's been a month. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an overview now of, of what we know about the law? 
Uh, and then what we've seen in the past month in terms of how it's been interpreted and sort of the extent to which the fears about the law have, were uh, either uh, overstated or actually understated when it comes to how it's being used. Uh, thanks. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Scott. Um, and thank you to IPI for organizing this event at a time when global attention is understandably probably elsewhere. Here in Hong Kong, um, we are on the front line, I would say, of the most ambitious and systemic effort, as you have already mentioned, to kind of erase, curtail, um, and even prevent contrary views and free expression. So um, we appreciate that this event is being organized. It's an important time for us. A little bit about this national security law. Um, I guess whether you would say it's worse than what you expected would, would depend on a couple of factors. Number one, how much you knew or appreciated about the socialist legal system in China before, uh, before you saw this, this bill. And I suppose number two, your, your level of optimism or confidence in the Hong Kong courts and their abilities um, to continue to uh, exercise you know, judgment and um, continue to, to pursue the liberal rule of law tradition in Hong Kong. So it's, let me say that this is not a national security law first, um, in which Hong Kong courts can always exercise judgment in the liberal rule of law tradition that they traditionally have had over, uh, over cases. This is a law, this national security law, which saw the immediate establishment of central government state security officials in the city. They are operating openly and offici officially and they are not themselves subject to Hong Kong law. So um, that's a profound change for, for um, the, the legal system of Hong Kong. Um, it is a law that applies to everyone in Hong Kong and it is a law that potentially applies to everyone in the world. There are, uh, of course, in addition to the Central People's Security Office, there is a local committee, um, this local counterpart organization, uh, the Committee on Safeguarding National Security is comprised of government officials in Hong Kong, uh, including the Director of Immigration and his presence um, is not a coincidence and it already has had a clear impact on foreign journalists and their ability to report in Hong Kong. We have seen refusal of visas and refusal of visa extensions. So, um, but that is a local, that's the local institution which also reports directly to Beijing. So, um, and it has a senior party member sitting amongst its membership. Uh, this is also a law that places a duty on media organizations. And that duty includes promoting and raising awareness of the national security law, of national security and of the need and the obligation to abide by the law. This is not a duty that is elaborated in any sense. Um, there are no instructions given to local media on how they might fulfill this duty. But it is certainly clear that that operates, that duty and obligation is operating to kind of instill fear and uncertainty. The duty of the media, as we all know, is not to act as a mouthpiece for the government. And the duties that are imposed by this law, I would say, lie in direct conflict with actually the very important role that Hong Kong journalists have been playing um, in their capacity to provide oversight of governance. And in Hong Kong, this is an even more critical role because uh, Hong Kong has never been anything more than a quasi-democracy at, at its highest. It is a law that also provides for secret trials. So um, the media will not be permitted in trials that involve state secrets and no definition of state secrets is provided. But if we look to examples of state secrets um, from our mainland counterparts, we can expect you know, potentially things such as you know, the financial holdings of important party members um, or even you know, details of state policy that are widely available, but that are some that are curated into a meaningful investigative journalist piece. So um, the absence of definitions and that plasticity of concepts like national security and state secrets uh, are very concerning. It's a law that also captures uh, behaviors like peaceful assembly and free expression. So on the second day of operation, the Hong Kong government banned the slogan, liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our time. So a slogan or a chant is, is now deemed 
um, either subversive or successive, depending on the context. It is also a law that saw the police suggesting forcefully that the uh, Lenin walls, the mosaic walls of post-it notes that have come to be a sort of hallmark feature of the city, everywhere from sidewalks to cafes to university campuses, might be unlawful. Um, and so the police are very active in their interpretation of what they consider to be potential national security law offenses. And this is very dangerous. This plasticity, again, of application, they, it's serving to embolden an already very dangerously emboldened police force. So we have seen investigations launched already um, concerning individuals who are holding empty sheets of paper now. So uh, another item that has been deemed unlawful or potentially a breach of the national security law is, of course, um, the forbidden term Hong Kong independence. We saw uh, protesters and demonstrators uh, continuing to assemble with blank sheets of paper and then being pursued by police um, on the grounds of national security law threats or risks. Um, it criminalizes conduct, I would say, that um, in a more significant way than previous laws would capture. So if you, for example, um, on the night before this law were enacted, um, were, were you know, um, involved in a scenario that might be considered an unlawful assembly, um, that, that could potentially result in a tariff for you. Um, but um, but it's it's not a it's not a, a certainty that you would be successfully prosecuted for unlawful assembly, but what this law what this law does is it provides a starting point. So once there is a national security law um, trigger, we see a starting point for tariffs at three years minimum. So in that sense, it does remove the ability of judges um, to interpret down. The, the provisions or the seriousness of the offense. The minimum offense tariff is three years, the maximum is life in prison. So um, this criminalization is of course a matter of serious concern. Uh, it's a concern for um, not just individuals but also journalists um, and particularly I would say investigative journalists. When you introduce this type of bifurcation in the legal system, um, and now we have a bifurcated legal system in Hong Kong, we, we are not certain that Hong Kong courts will hear these cases. Um, there are scenarios where Beijing uh, and the national, um, the rather central people national security office that is now operating in Hong Kong can deem that the scenario is so serious that it will be tried by a court in mainland China. And so we're looking at a bifurcated system um, and not really understanding or having any judicial interpretation or authority about what type of case will actually be sent into the socialist legal system in mainland China, into the criminal justice system of mainland China. So um, I guess, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's this very broad conceptualization of national security, which is probably most concerning to um, to journalists who are seeking to report right now. Endangering national security um, from a socialist legalist perspective, from the continental perspective of mainland China, it can mean virtually anything. I've mentioned already things like financial holdings and state policies that are openly circulated, but we have in Hong Kong, in our Hong Kong law, something, um, you know, anything that disrupts the formulation and implementation of the national security law. That's a very broad category that doesn't doesn't have any really meaningful um, limits, right? So it doesn't it, it doesn't seem to pass this proportionality requirement when you have a restriction on a right that it should be a clear restriction that is understandable to the public. Uh, much of this law is so ambiguously construed that it would fail that test of legal certainty. It's it's intentionally ambiguous and opaque. And then the second, I guess, very concerning uh, provision in the, in the, amongst the four new tariffs is this, um, this idea of provoking hatred. So um, there is a clause uh, under foreign interference, which provides specifically that provoking hatred either um, among Hong Kong residents or towards the central people's government um, is an offense, is an offense that can attract the tariff of up to life in prison again. 
uh, it's, it refers to unlawful hatred, which is a bit unusual because I can't um, personally think of a scenario where you would have lawful hatred, but it is very specific. Um, and I think that, you know, th this particular clause worries me um, more than others in the sense that um, I would think that, you know, having seen the treatment of journalists in China just recently who um, have, you know, reported on the exposés on the Uyghurs, on the concentration camps in Xinjiang, and um, who were covering the plight of Wuhan um, at the height of the coronavirus, you know, we, we've seen how these journalists have been treated. And... Um, the, the, the potential for that type of uh, the normalization of the Chinese socialist legal system to come into Hong Kong, the potential is very, very high. Yeah, uh, thanks for that sharing, which is, a, which is a great overview. And I think a lot of what you say, this, this concept of these extremely broad concepts, uh, national security, this plasticity, which can basically mean anything, combined with these, as, as you mentioned, these enormous penalties up to, up to life in prison. Um, this combination, I think, is, is incredibly toxic and it's something that we see, obviously not only in Hong Kong, but, but in other countries. Um, and I think one of the big questions today is how is this affecting journalism? Uh, are journalists able to do their jobs and actually cover uh, topics that are related to these issues? So I wanna take that question and give it uh, right to, to Chris from the Hong Kong uh, Journalists Association how has this affected uh, the work of, of, of local of journalists, local journalists in Hong Kong uh, since the law's implementation? What have you seen? What are the fears of, of your members around this? Uh, thanks, Scott, and thanks uh, IPI uh, for, ho for hosting this. Uh, when, the, when the idea of, um, say, enacting uh, NSL um, was passed, uh, then was, was passed by the National People's Congress, uh, back in May, and uh, the association has done a survey among our members. We have about 600 um, full members, uh, including, say, foreign correspondents uh, based here. They are some of them are our members. Uh, about one third of them had uh, have responded to the survey. Uh, almost an overwhelming 90% of them oppose oppose uh, the enactment by China's legislature. On national security, and often ninety percent say fear that uh, press freedoms will be undermined, and more than half of them fear their personal safety will be um, in danger. Say with the um, with with the enactment of the law, that was before we know we know anything about the law. Uh, for simple reasons, uh, I think Hong Kong people knows the China system or the lack of systems, I think better, better than many other people. Uh, many people travel to China, uh, saw what exactly happened there. Uh, so um, if, if they say that law was going to be enacted or formulated and, and enacted by China's legislature, I don't think anyone uh, will have confidence in it. And also uh, bear in mind the overall, I think, worsening uh, relations between Hong Kong and the central government. I think they see Hong Kong as a threat. They see Hong Kong as a threat to, say, um, uh, 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 a national, say, uh, territorial integrity. People trying to uh, see the Hong Kong, say, uh, uh, um, um, to, to, well, um, seeking independence. I think so. Those circumstances, I think, uh, are, are, are the worst time for any move to, say, uh, touch on national security. So um, I, I'm sure that uh, if we do another survey this time, it, it could be perhaps 100% uh, still uh, opposed to it uh, for obvious reasons, uh, some of which have been uh, quite uh, extensively mentioned by Sharon. Uh, in the law itself, um, there are just, it's just much a more harsh, uh, broad and weight um, that many people had thought uh, before the law uh, was announced, say uh, one day before uh, uh, it, 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 it took effect. Uh, so uh, say slogans like liberate Hong Kong could well um, be in trouble. So how about reporting that? Um, the Chinese, uh, the mainland Chinese officials or even, or even the probation people here 
they won't differentiate between reporting and advocating. Very often they, they say, uh, well, uh, perhaps uh, reporting could also be interpret or construe as some form of uh, advocacy. So um, what if, for instance, uh, journal or, or, or media here um, say, uh, we'd like to do a, 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 an in-depth series of analysis articles on say the post 2047 future of Hong Kong. Is any form of independence one of the possible options? Why not talk to the academics, uh, look at other places? But I'm sure that uh, this sort of stories will now be highly uh, dangerous, will now be highly dangerous. Uh, journalists, uh, uh, media, uh, editors, I think will be extremely uh, cautious in going into this uh, uh, dangerous uh, zone. I set an example, I think months ago, um, Radio Television Hong Kong, a government run, government run uh, broadcaster, they have a program, they have an interview with the whole World Health Organization official asking a straightforward question. Will they reconsider Taiwan's membership in WHO? That's a straightforward, normal reporting to us, reporting. Uh, but that question, that program was criticized by both the Hong Kong and the Chinese government for breaching the one China principle. That was before the NSL. I guess now with the NSL, I think this sort of a program, breaching one China principles, well, almost like secession, almost like secession. So that, that falls within the, uh, the, the, the law. So uh, the law itself has a lot of, uh, 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 caused a lot of anxieties. And then um, the, the perhaps, uh, and also a bigger problem is that in the past, uh, Hong Kong journalists uh, are basically feel, well, relatively safe that uh, if they do stories here, even, we'll, even if they give information from a visit in mainland China, from the sources in mainland China, if they publish the stories here, uh, they feel a little bit secure with the protection of our systems, court system. Uh, but now uh, the, the courts here do not have full jurisdiction to all cases. So which cases could go to mainland courts? I would say China will decide. You can imagine that uh, if the National Security uh, Agency uh, in the mainland say, well, we want, it, we want this case to be uh, tried in mainland China for reason ABC. I don't think our government will say no to it. Uh, so even though there's a lot of, uh, say, rhetoric assurance saying that, uh, well, the, the, the number of cases that go to China will be very, very small, but no one take it seriously. And uh, no one would take it for granted that uh, that the Chinese mainland Chinese officials will be restrained in enforcement of law. Uh, that restraint, uh, I think, is not in, in 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 the Communist Party's DNA. And our worry is also that uh, our government here is also losing their self restraint. Look at how the police uh, enforce the law in the 12, past 12 months in handling protests. Um, we see the government, the, the government here um, simply not able to uphold and defend um, the autonomy given in the, in, in the basic law. And they see the courts, the judiciary as um, perhaps the, the last or strongest um, safeguard but unfortunately, in this law, uh, it cripples, uh, it cripples the, the court. And then the other major worry is that uh, in the law, it says quite clear that uh, they will supervise, regulate media, foreign media, and also other groups. I guess that refer to NGOs. And um, so um, we've already seen uh, uh, tightening, say, uh, well, uh, handling of a web visa. 
for foreign journalists. And um, that's, a, that's a broader strategy of, uh, say, tighten control on uh, foreign, uh, foreign media here. So um, there's a lot of uh, uh, fears in the law itself. The question I think many people are asking is how they're, go how they're going to enforce it. And um, that will be the key question. But unfortunately, it will now be a matter up to them. You never know until it is and, and, and enforced. So, so I guess so what, we, what we see now is that chilling effect um, uh, is quite uh, prevalent. Uh, in the in in the media, start asking questions on stories that they have done before. Will they will they still be well, uh, safe now doing it? And um, that's in the news. Uh, foreign news agencies are scaling down their their their, their operation uh, because of the concerns and because of the uh, change of um, change of policy. And uh, for those who handle who cover China stories, I think they are the most dangerous groups. I guess, I guess many of them are, are, are making their own assessment and perhaps uh, finding different ways to, um, well, if they still want to do report China and write about those census stories, how, how they can do it uh, without, say, risking their own um, well, uh, well, well-being. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sure. So, Go ahead. Let me let me bring in uh, Tom here. Thank you very much for that, Chris. I think you raised a lot of uh, key issues that I want to come back to, especially this question of this chilling effect and self censorship, which you've already been describing. Um, I think it would be useful now to, to hear from Tom um, everything that that all these possibilities that Chris has been describing. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you were in newsroom at the Hong Kong Free Press, um, how you have responded to the possibilities that this law raises, um, what, what impact you've seen or, or that you, you fear may come onto your, to your journalism and sort of the, the attitude and the precautions that you are, that you are taking now uh, to be able to continue doing your job um, under this, uh, in this new environment. Yeah, thanks for having me, Scott. And um, yeah, as Sharon suggested, I, I can't think of another place historically or geographically where there has been such a speedy uh, giving way of a uh, open and free society to, you know, basically authoritarianism is, is what the law could potentially represent. And for us, uh, it is just uh, at the moment uh, has meant that we need to hope for the best, prepare for the worst and keep calm and carry on. Um, certainly this law is vaguely worded and it could be broadly applied and it lays out some very fuzzy ill-defined, perhaps invisible red lines uh, and raises questions uh, that Chris has alluded to there. In, this, in the short time this webinar has been live, we've heard that Tony Chung, a, a, a political figure, a pro-independence activist, has been arrested, the, the first uh, of arrest of its kind under the security law. And in theory, you know, we could be scrambling and asking questions as to whether it would be, we'd be allowed to interview such people, um, you know, can, can we include these banned slogans uh, when reporting on them? But really, for I think us journalism people, it's not so much asking these questions, which we've tried to ask before. I have personally and repeatedly sought to answer the question as to whether the protest anthem, Glory to Hong Kong, is illegal or not. It's banned in schools, apparently. Um, but the real issue is that I don't think we are ever going to get answers to these questions. The law is designed to make the media self-censor, and not just the media. We see it in different sectors, as we do in the mainland, in academia, in the arts, sources we speak to, lawyers even, unwilling to speak. Um, our op-ed section has certainly died down um, the last few weeks. Um, but, um, so, but, we, but as I say, we hope for the best, because uh, as Sharon also mentioned, um, these th we do have to see test cases on this and we need to see how it goes to court. The problem with that is that ultimately Beijing uh, has final say in all that. The closed door tr trials, uh, uh, surveillance and warrantless uh, raids and, and uh, hand-picked judges and trials that could take place in mainland China. And ultimately, um, 
this time bomb we have in the mini constitution, the basic law here, um, if there is something Beijing doesn't like, and if it travels up to the highest courts, it can literally reinterpret the constitution as it did so to oust democratically elected lawmakers a few years ago. Um, so you, you, can, you can certainly see there are concerns for the rule of law um, as the others have, have brought up there. As for prepare for the worst, well, we were certainly scrambling around for those early days uh, when, when we were also trying to report on the news of what has happened. Um, myself in particular, re talking to as many lawyers as I could, asking Sharon difficult questions she can't answer, talking to cyber security experts, business experts, because we feel that whether it's our donors, our readers, our sources, um, every sector of what we do could be affected potentially. And we try and seek to future-proof ourselves from trouble. Um, so as for a start, we, we had to speak to our team every day to assess their comfort level as to what was happening. Um, if there are things um, we may need to change, whether we're going to stick entirely to our code of ethics and um, whether we need capacity for using uh, anonymous bylines on certain pieces. Uh, but eventually we all came to um, make personal commitments to protect sources in the sense that this law um, could see a penalty of six months in prison or a $100,000 Hong Kong fine um, for, for failing to cooperate with the authorities to decrypt devices or, or to hand over information about our sources. Uh, so we've, we've certainly made that public commitment that we're ready to face that penalty. I've been racing to find um, a place where we could potentially set up a backup entity or an umbrella company um, to fall back on um, should things hit the fan here. I spent a week looking at Taiwan and then Ireland, Singapore, Nevada, like uh, Switzerland for a while. It's no secret because we're not looking for secrecy. We're looking for to be out of the reach, I think, of, um, of influence of, of uh, draconian measures like this. And um, this week, I'm now looking at Estonia. So we might have a Estonian arm of sorts. Um, we're also changing banks from HSBC that seems to be quite vulnerable and rather supportive of this law uh, and seeking to switch to an American one. We've published a Q&A in the hope of reassuring our um, sources, our readers uh, about how we're dealing with this. Um, but we don't know how it will be applied. It might be the case, um, listening to the pro Beijing camp, that they will come after crowdfunding or something like this. So, um, um, but it, we've also taken quite draconian measures ourselves in that I have literally chained our desktops, um, uh, PCs to the desks. There's been a couple of raids uh, recently on different entities in Hong Kong. Uh, but of course, all of our devices are encrypted. Um, we use uh, secure apps and uh, software um, on all our work devices and all our team are down with that. I mean, the fact is we have to be nimble. We're a small company, so we're quite good at that. And in a way, be water and be several uh, steps ahead. And um, I'm sure my staff will agree. I'm not much of an editor. I wear several hats, but um, I think I have an unfortunate uh, knack for predicting uh, what may happen in the months and years to come. And I must say, you know, in 2015, when I set this up, uh, we sought to, you know, make it future proof, um, weather any storm, you know, no shareholders, non-profit, um, the freest, most independent, transparent and accountable news outlet, making sure that um, everything is watertight when it comes to our accounts in the fear of any legal or bureaucratic terrorism. Um, and I think we are seeing the inklings of bureaucratic terrorism when, um, uh, immigration is, is, is wielding red tape and ousting journalists, you know, from the city. Um, but what, what one couldn't foresee in 2015 was that the very basis of what um, I set this up on and any other news outlet in Hong Kong was the constitutional guarantees of freedom of expression, of the press. And, um, and you, you know, when, when those are in the basic law, you, 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 you feel that there is some certainty that there will always be around. Um, so, so that has caused us to have this whole other round of, um, of reassessment as, as to who we are, what we're doing. And I think a lot of our work, because there's never a slow news day in Hong Kong, will be centered around now um, monitoring, telling the story of the city's integration into the mainland systems. Um, we've got a, a digital countdown clock in our office. Um, 
that's counting down to 2047 when Hong Kong's autonomy is meant to expire. And we may be quite literally physically blended into the Po River Delta region. Um, I, I think it's a little redundant now, along with these analogies of slow boiling frogs and death by a thousand cuts when it comes to um, the, the city's differentiations between here and, the, and, and, and China, in that we, I may have to change this countdown clock to, to count up from a month ago um, when this law first came in. Um, but I think we, as HKFP in an English, um, albeit foreigner owned local news outlet, will see trouble coming. They may come for, you know, pro-democracy outlets and, and others before us. And um, I would hope that we are prepared. But uh, I think we also have been checking in to ensure that we're safeguarding against self-censorship and that our team are comfortable and we know the drill as to whether someone does feel uncomfortable with what they might be reporting. Um, but as Chris has alluded to, I think that other um, editors of the newsrooms, um, others in the uh, media landscape in Hong Kong, and the majority of them are pro-Beijing politically. They're either outright owned by the Chinese Communist Party, owned by people with business interests in the mainland, or owned by Chinese conglomerates. Uh, they will be particularly overly cautious and tiptoeing around red lines and, and um, self-censoring in advance. And um, I, I think that's something all of us journalists need to be careful of uh, in the months uh, 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 and, and years to come, is okay. not falling in line with this uh, in advance and making sure that we put up a fight when and if um, you know, it happens. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Tom, and I think that uh, leads us well uh, into this uh, into Anthony's uh, contribution. Thanks for your thanks for your patience, uh, Anthony. Sure. Um, and, and I think Tom already started talking a little bit about uh, what the future may bring. And actually, I was reading uh, in his uh, article in the Guardian was asking. I think you were asking Tom, uh, is it going to be something like Singapore? Is it going to be something like mainland China? Or is it going to be uh, Xinjiang? Uh, what we see in Hong Kong mm -hmm. in the next few years. Can, can you give us your analysis of, of, based on what we have seen in the past few weeks since the law was, was put into effect, where are things headed uh, in Hong Kong? How, how, how bad and how dark is it going, is it going to get in your view? Yeah, I, I think the real significance of this national security law is, is much more than just that we have these four new amorphously defined criminal offences that we all have to uh, be careful not to fall foul of in Hong Kong. What the national security law is really about is about bringing the entire PRC state security apparatus into Hong Kong uh, and setting up in Hong Kong the same dual party state governance structure that, that exists in the mainland. And this is being done through uh, setting up that National Security Committee that uh, Sharon referred to earlier, placing on that National Security Committee a, a, a National Security Advisor directly appointed by, by Beijing, and he happens to be also the, the Director of Beijing's representative office here in Hong Kong, the Central Government Liaison um, Office Director, and he is now sitting on this Hong Kong uh, government body, which without doubt is the mo the single most powerful government body in the Hong Kong government and has influence over all aspects of government policy. And he, without doubt, will be the most influential voice in that room, a, a direct representative of, of the party. On top of that, we also have, as, as Sharon mentioned, the PRC State Security Bureau, themselves, the department themselves, ministry having a, a large office right here on the ground in Hong Kong operating directly on, in Hong Kong. So effectively that entire state sec security state, party security state that has been operating in, in the mainland is now operating in Hong Kong as well. So what that means for the media is that the, the, the risk profile here is effectively the same as the risk profile in the mainland. Uh, in terms of operating as a member of the media. Um, so I guess you, you mentioned a few different analogies earlier. I wouldn't say that, that Hong Kong is becoming more like Singapore. I would say that Hong Kong is China um, and, and, and that the same risk considerations that would apply to reporting in China should now apply to reporting in Hong Kong. Now that doesn't mean that that no reporting happens at all. And I think as uh, as Sharon's colleague, Keith Richberg, uh, also of the, 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 the Department of Journalism at Hong Kong U has pointed out, plenty of reporting happens in China and in many other equally, if not more uh, repressive regimes and countries. That doesn't mean that no reporting is gonna happen at all in Hong Kong, but all the same 
risk considerations, the same dangers to journalists, and in particular, the same dangers to sources that apply in mainland China uh, will also also apply here. Uh, the same weaponization of the visa system uh, in relation to journalists that has always applied in the mainland is now already we're seeing applying here in Hong Kong as well. Um, and I think that, uh, that, that there's something that's, that's, that's going to be very significant. Um, I just mentioned sources and, and Tom had referred to sources as well just now. I think that's another really important aspect of this national security law going forward that the, the pressure on um, media outlets to reveal sources and, and the measures that media outlets will have to take to um, uh, whether to encrypt or indeed even periodically destroy records that they have to avoid them potentially being subject to uh, subject to, to government demands for information disclosure is, is going to be very important. So the, 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 the awareness to uh, more than ever in Hong Kong protect one's sources and take measures for appropriate information security is going to become really important. Um, and the final aspect of this law that is that has been much commented upon and was the biggest, perhaps the biggest surprise of all when the law was announced was its ex extraterritorial effect, um, that it does apply to anyone who breaches this law wherever they may be in the world. And when you combine that with the potential government attacks on sources, with the pressure on international media organizations that may have bureaus in Hong Kong, that, that could lead to potentially looking forward into the future some quite frightening scenarios. For example, what would happen if a reporter uh, somewhere in the world, in, in, in the UK or in Europe or in America, uh, interviewed uh, exile Hong Kong political dissidents, and we already have some um, who are talking about secessionary or subversionary activities, who may refer on an anonymous basis to colleagues or people they're working with in Hong Kong, uh, and the Hong Kong authorities want to find out who those people are that they're talking about. Um, and the Hong Kong authorities may send, they have under the new law a power to send information requests to any company or organization demanding that they provide, disclose certain information. And a, a, an orga, a media organization that uh, has a reporter outside Hong Kong who may have this information but has an office inside Hong Kong may find their Hong Kong office or their Hong Kong employees being subject to one of these kinds of information requests. And that kind of is just an example of the kind of situation that an international media organization with a presence in Hong Kong may find themselves in, 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 a, in a very difficult situation. Um, so given the worldwide scope, given the potential impact on sources and the potential impact on reporting activities, I think just looking forward, um, we're gonna really have to, the, the media is gonna have to be very aware and, and to risk manage uh, all of these potential issues accordingly. Um, but at, at the end of the day, as a, as a number of speakers have, have mentioned already, it's still very early days. We're waiting to see how the co Hong Kong court, courts rule on these arrests as they've come forward, that the police have certainly been very zealous and over-enthusiastic in their arresting. And let's see how many of those arrests actually hold up in court. And we may start to get a sense of the terrain, but at the moment, it's all very much um, very much shrouded in fog. And I guess we're, we're sort of sailing in the, sailing in the dark somewhat. Um, thank you for that. I think that all of you pointed a very, uh, painted a very like, disturbing picture, to be honest, of the situation in Hong Kong and uh, and what the future can bring. Um, just a quick reminder to participants: feel free uh, to to uh, put your questions in the chat um, because I think now we want to take up some of the questions that, that we've received so far. Um, and this is something that I was the first question is something that I think a lot of people are wondering, uh, as I am as well. Uh, we have a question from Ginko Kobayashi asking, she's asking specifically what the UK can do, uh, whether, it would, whether it should take a, a greater lead to help Hong Kong. But if I may, I just want to expand that question a little bit. Um, you know, we have this disturbing situation in which you know, democracy and, and the rule of law is disappearing in, in, in a country in Hong Kong. Uh, in terms of the international reaction, um, how, and, and if any one of you feel free to pick up this question, uh, how um, how would you describe or rate the international reaction so far, and 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 what can or should um, states and, and also you know foreign media companies as well? What what can they do to support uh, journalists and, and others in Hong Kong? Um, I'm not sure if if any of you would like to uh, jump on that question. I might start just by just yeah. by saying that just to make the point that we've reached a point now where even 
answering that question gives us all pause um, because under the national security law, one of the offenses is colluding with foreign forces to, um, to, to disturb or the Hong Kong government in various ways. Um, and so even advocating, you know, advocating things like sanctions or advocating measures by foreign governments against the Hong Kong government or against the Chinese government is potentially committing an offense under, under the national security law itself. So you'll see people from Hong Kong now responding to these sorts of questions very, um, uh, very nervously, <laughs> given the new environment. And that's just one example of the changes that this, this national security law has brought into, uh, has brought in with it. So I just want to sort of say that by way of, by way of preface to whatever anyone else may wish, wish to say in answer to that question, that, that there's a reason why people sort of uh, have to word their responses very carefully. Um, but I, I would also just add that I think that probably it's fair to say that I think the international response um, may have been more robust than China was expecting. I don't think that China, I mean, I, I don't think that China had expected such a strong and also such a unified response from 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 Western governments. Um, I think they probably suspected they would be able to get away with with what they were doing in Hong Kong, you know, as they have, you know, in many other parts of China, you know, consistently for many years. And I think that the, 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 it's obviously come at a sensitive time with, with the coronavirus and with many other geopolitical forces that are in play. Um, but all that has resulted in, in, in a very robust response generally from Western governments, which I think is probably more than, than, than China was expecting. And already we've seen many concrete measures from Cancelling extradition agreements to um, immigration opportunities, which are, which I think, are all, uh, uh, yeah, certainly solid policy responses to uh, to what's been happening here. But I defer to others as well. Um, I, I would like to make. To respond, but, yeah. uh, um, I would like to make two points. Um, uh, first, um, yes, uh, that's a that's a challenge for the association because uh, in the law it does say. Um, uh, collusion uh, with foreign forces. So um, our relations with uh, the international communities or bodies like IPI or other IPJ, uh, sorry, IFJ, uh, I think that's something that we uh, will look into it uh, carefully. Um, in fact, before the NSL uh, took effect, um, we wrote to the UN um, on the issue of uh, police uh, brutality. Uh, in dealing with the protesters. And um, that was before N NSL. Um, but after the, end, um, I think shortly after that, in fact, um, China's uh, People's Daily uh, has an article uh, singling us for attack, saying that, uh, saying that uh, we saw uh, foreign, uh, well, we, we may complain to a foreign body and uh, which is uh, politically um, incorrect, I think, in, in China. So um, that, that's something that uh, the association uh, has to be uh, quite, quite, quite careful. Uh, but of course, uh, we, um, we, we will still speak up on things, well, how we see NSL, why we think it's wrong and the concerns, uh, but we will be uh, extremely careful in, say, um, uh, in going into what China sees as uh, political uh, areas. The second point, um, as Anthony uh, said, uh, um, I guess, yes, um, the, the international relation, uh, reaction, uh, I think that's something perhaps the Chinese government uh, has underestimated. But, but unfortunately, the, I guess, the, the strong international rela uh, reaction uh, might further reinforce their uh, conspiracy theory that um, is all uh, well, uh, part of uh, the world against uh, China. Uh, so they, so they took strong will. They, they, they make make, make Hong Kong issue, um, um, blow it up, and then put pressure on on China. So I'm I'm, I'm sure perhaps uh, that's their uh, immediate reaction to that. And um, the problem in China now, I guess, is that um, the hotline. Uh, hotline wheel, I think, just is just so predominating. Uh, the what we call moderate forces and uh, moderate voices are uh, well further and further marginalized. So um, it's pushing the, uh, the 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 decision, the diplomacy, the Hong Kong policy to an extreme. Uh, we don't know how long that period will be, 
but it's, it seems to us that uh, it's just a normal, couldn't last long, but, but who knows? I think um, Xi Jinping is already in power for eight, nine, uh, nine years, and uh, he may be there for a, an even longer period of time, uh, no one knows. Um, but, but that's something that, uh, that we have to face with. I just ask, as um, I've talked a little bit about the censorship, uh, self-censorship uh, among journalists, um, what about audiences and, and your readers, for example, of different media? I mean, I'm sure that you know, looking at, for example, the financial situation of, of media, uh, many will depend on subscriptions, donations, uh, this type of thing. Is this an issue that you're worried about, that people now will be afraid actually uh, to, to access certain media, to support certain media? Um, how, how big of a concern is this for you? This, like, this will be directed both to, to Tom and Chris. Well, first of all, we are um, impartial. We're neither pro-democracy or pro-Beijing. I challenge anyone when you read our hard news copy um, to suggest otherwise, really. I mean, we don't seek subscriptions, um, but we accept donations. You ask, you know, whether foreigners can get involved, donate and support, you know, news outlets like ours. Um, I would say until we hear otherwise, then, you know, two thirds of our readers are foreigners. We're in English. We are seeking to tell the Hong Kong story to the world. Um, and like I say, I don't know whether they'll come after fundraising or PayPal or Stripe will be pressured or HSBC when it comes to um, their involvement in, in uh, helping fundraising for news outlets. Um, but that's why we are, you know, setting up backup entities that we can just flip the switch um, should that happen. I've had emails from uh, op-ed writers, concerns from sources, and a couple of donors who've sought to like switch to cash or wanted to um, uh, halt their monthly donations. But we've also seen an influx of donations because of the uh, concerns over press freedom and what's been happening. So it's very early, it's too early to tell um, what the effect may be. And it's, it's also difficult. We just don't know as to how this law might be applied. We can just seek to future proof ourselves. As to whether um, we will remain in the city, I, I've suggested some places that we've been looking at setting things up as a backup. Um, I'm not a complete idiot. I mean, if it gets to the point where it feels like things are like the mainland and it becomes impossible for us to gain funds or to do our jobs or to um, you know, put up a whole news story, um, then under those circumstances, and if journalists are being in prison for years, of course, we would prefer to continue and do this from abroad um, than, than stay here, although we all love Hong Kong and want to stay. Um, but I, I, I think that would be extreme circumstances if we, we have a certain level of tolerance. For instance, if uh, we were made to black out uh, illegal slogans or whatever, and we can put a, an explanatory note on that, I think we could tolerate that. But, um, you know, if, if things start to resemble mainland China, we wouldn't stick around. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know if um, I have any privilege uh, being a foreigner or a permanent resident or a British person or a business owner, whatever, uh, or if it's a hindrance. Um, but uh, we, 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 I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> but um, yeah, we don't know. So you, you answered it. It's probably the answer to your question. You, you answered it, yes. Uh, it, yeah, exactly. It was about audiences and whether there's also this fear and self-censorship among audiences. Yeah, we've seen bits of that, but uh, it's hard to tell for now. If I could add a yes. small point on the on self censorship. So, um, one of the smallest comforts that um, that came with this law, there had been a lot of discussion as to whether it would be retroactively or retrospectively applied. So, um, the ex post facto mystery. Um, there was talk that this law would be uh, applied to um, acts that happened prior to the promulgation. In other words. Um, and so it, 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 on the surface, does not. There is not a provision in the law that says that it applies to prior acts. But what we have seen is government officials in Hong Kong um, saying that as part, and, and police and government officials saying as part of the investigatory process, for example, if they arrest someone who has uh, a Hong Kong independence item, flag, pin, banner, um, or um, who has been chanting, you know, the the uh, offensive slogans, or um, but but as part of their process, they will look back into their social media, 
and they will look back at comments or likes or you know be behavior that would assist the um, prosecution to prove their case that an individual had successionist tendencies, in other words. So um, a lot of the self-censorship um, that, that we saw, um, there was a lot of people who left social media. Um, giant um, groups of activists, pro-democracy pro activists, um, even just ordinary citizens have been removing their social media profiles on the basis that this past activity, whether it's commenting on an article or liking an article or following a particular uh, news organization could be used as part of the case against them, so. Yeah, I mean, the, the guy arrested tonight, he disbanded his group ahead of the national security law. So it's unclear, you know, uh, how solidly we can rely on this being not retrospective. Uh, but, but I agree, yeah, I, I, I think there is capacity with the law, as you've, as you've noticed, for, uh, as we see with some of the uh, pro-democracy election hopefuls, that they will look back through your social media, as, as, as one election hopeful put it, um, sort of bureaucratic stalking, something you posted six months ago, even before the law was uh, enacted. And um, I have to admit, you know, I've got souvenirs from recent political protests and yellow umbrella and this kind of thing, knocking around the flat, and um, they will be in a package going back to the UK at some point, because um, I think there is also a fear when we are future-proofing ourselves that there will be this sort of a jigsaw put together that you know you could be investigated for one discrepancy here, and then uh, it could be alluded or suggested that you had some seditious intent over there because you happen to have this uh, yellow mug knocking around or something like that. So. It's, it's yet another you know, broad provision in the, in the law that we're having to um, think ahead on. Uh, thanks very much to, to all of you for that. Um, let me put uh, two final questions to you that we have from participants and then I'll maybe ask uh, one final question uh, and then, then we'll wrap up. Uh, we have two questions sort of looking again at the international aspects of this. So again, you know, obviously feel free to to respond or not, uh, according to, to how you feel about that. One is asking uh, specifically about the future of, of US-Chinese relations, given um, this recent uh, conflict around the consulates, the closing of consulates, uh, one in Texas and, and then one in, one in China, um, whether this, whether the security law is, and, and, and the issue and the discussions around it were to prompt a new level of hostility uh, between China and and uh, and the rest of the world, or specifically uh, Western countries, um, and the other question is asking: oh, well, There seems to be a discrepancy between the attitudes of Western governments, and on the other hand, the attitudes of of multinational companies. I suppose still investing in China, um, and and whether this is whether this is not helping, or, or whether it's. Uh, whether it is helping. So I wonder if any of you wants to take a stab at either of those questions. So, you know, whether we're going to see increased hostility because of the, the security law and possibly a bit about this role of, of business in this debate, whether there is uh, enough support from, from the business community, for example, for, for journalists and press freedom. I'll put it out on the table if anybody wants to, to answer it. If not, uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say something which I, I think is a, 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 perhaps a slightly different angle on the first question, um, which is that uh, the national security law, um, as I mentioned earlier, changes the risk profile for media operating in Hong Kong. It also changes the risk profile for um, the citizens and companies of governments that are experiencing tensions with the PRC government, because all of those um, tools that the PRC government have used in the mainland um, in the past uh, are now available to them in Hong Kong to various degrees. So where you have um, tensions between the US and the Chinese government, uh, you know, a hostile relationship, uh, that suddenly means that um, 
to the same extent that that U.S. citizens or U.S. companies may be open to retribution in mainland China, uh, the same risk considerations should also apply to them in Hong Kong. In the same way that we have um, the, the unfortunate Canadians effectively taken hostage by uh, the Chinese government in the mainland as as sort of uh, as hostages with the, the, to bargain against the Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou in Canada. Um, that's sort of the kind of situation that, that we would never have imagined possible in, in Hong Kong in the past, but, but the new national security law provides some kind of a basis for that to occur. So, so in the context of worsening relations, as, as the questioner sort of raised, um, the national security law certainly changes the landscape for, for people here in Hong Kong as well. Uh, thanks, uh, Anthony, for, for that. Um, I want to come back maybe for, for one final question actually to you, Sharon, um, since you are also obviously your role at the university, uh, at the journalism school, um, you know, there's a lot of questions now about the future of journalism in Hong Kong. Can there be actually a future for journalism in Hong Kong? And I wonder if you can give us a little bit of an idea of what, what the mood seems to be among uh, students who are, who are yeah, thinking about careers in journalism and, and whether they really, those careers can really happen in this, this situation, or whether there's any future at all for, for media. Um, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I think uh, in some ways it's, it's early days to make a prediction of, of how this law will impact, inter, um, I suppose the number of applicants and the number of people who are interested to come to Hong Kong. Uh, be, because we, we already have a cohort coming in September who I would say do not seem to be dissuaded. So if you think about the, the traditional journalism training that we provide, which is you know, fact-based, unbiased, fair reporting, and the environment that is Hong Kong right now, I mean, this is the, the story of a generation. This is a, this is a city experiencing um, the, the toughest series of events over the past 14 months. Uh, that it is ever known. So my students uh, at present, those who are in Hong Kong, are, are very busy. They have internship opportunities. They are freelancing. They are working as fixers. There's a big story to be told here. So at present, I think it's, it's in some ways a kind of healthy environment for, for students that are actively engaged in journalism right now. Um, the risks are very new. Um, they, they are only 30 days. We are only 30 days into the pipeline. We have uh, very uncertain boundaries or barriers, kind of, uh, you know, where are the new red lines? What are the 50 shades of red? What will get them in trouble? I don't think they have a full appreciation. I think that the students that we have right now are in this very strange cohort where they have been brought up under the Hong Kong legal tradition, having all of the, um, you know, uh, um, views and uh, passionate, um, you know, commitment to free expression and free press, and maybe um, not fully appreciating, just like there's no one really able to fully appreciate right now, how this law will develop and how it will impact journalism. So it's, it's extremely important, I think, for the, the students that we have to, um, to continue to, you know, be tenacious, be resourceful and tell this story. This story is happening um, on a day-by-day -day basis, we are we are seeing this this dismantling of rule of law, this um, aggression against free press. Our response is not to not report on it, but rather to encourage students to be actively engaged in it. And so far, they they are, but um, it's early days. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is again the theme that we've had today: this incredible uncertainty. About, about what is coming. And it reminds me a bit of what you were saying, Tommy, that when you started the free press, there was this idea that you, know, you have at least these constitutional guarantees that, can, that will serve as some kind of protection um, and, and which may not, may not apply uh, anymore. So um, yeah, a lot of concern. Um, any final questions from participants? I, I don't see any more. Um, any, any of our panelists, if you'd like to say any final words, uh, please do so. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll wrap up. Anything else that you that you want to mention that we haven't that you feel we haven't covered or, or touched on enough today? Um, you can't carry on. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Great. Um, well, listen. I want okay. to then think. Oh, <laughs> great. 
Okay, it's thank great, you. It's a great message to, to end. Um, yeah. To end this. Um, yeah, so I just want to uh, say a big thanks uh, from my PI side to all four of you. I think we're really fortunate to have uh, four really top experts um, and observers on the situation in Hong Kong. And I also want to thank actually all the participants that joined today. Uh, it's, uh, I know it's the, the middle of the holiday season in a lot of countries, um, but this is such an important issue. And I think I'm really glad to see a lot of people uh, following this discussion today. And, and uh, obviously from IPI side, we'll be following the situation very closely in Hong Kong. And I hope that uh, yeah, the international media will continue to, to report uh, on the developments in Hong Kong. So again, thank you very much. Thank you to our participants thank you. again for thank staying you. with us so all right. late. Um, all the best, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for caring for Hong Kong. Bye-bye.